Chapter 4, Part 1 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 4, Papal Persecutions, Part 1. Thus far, our history of persecution has been confined principally to the pagan world. We come now to a period when persecution, under the guise of Christianity, committed more enormities than ever disgraced the annals of paganism. Disregarding the maxims and the spirit of the gospel, the papal church, arming herself with the power of the sword, vexed the church of God and wasted it for several centuries, a period most appropriately termed in history the Dark Ages. The kings of the earth gave their power to the beast, and submitted to be trodden on by the miserable vermin that often filled the papal chair, as in the case of Henry, Emperor of Germany. The storm of papal persecution first burst upon the Waldenses in France. Persecution of the Waldenses in France Popery having brought various innovations into the church, and overspread the Christian world with darkness and superstition, some few, who plainly perceived the pernicious tendency of such errors, determined to show the light of the gospel in its real purity, and to disperse those clouds which artful priests had raised about it, in order to blind the people and obscure its real brightness. The principal among these was Berengarius, who, about the year 1000, boldly preached gospel truths, according to their primitive purity. Many, from conviction, assented to his doctrine, and were, on that account, called Berengarians. To Berengarius succeeded Pierre Bruis, who preached at Toulouse, under the protection of an earl named Hildelphonsus, and the whole tenets of the reformers, with the reasons of their separation from the Church of Rome, were published in a book written by Bruis under the title of Antichrist. By the year of Christ, 1140, the number of the reformed was very great, and the probability of its increasing alarmed the Pope, who wrote to several princes to banish them from their dominions, and employed many learned men to write against their doctrines. In A.D. 1147, because of Henry of Toulouse, deemed their most eminent preacher, they were called Henertians, and as they would not admit of any proofs relative to religion, but what could be deduced from the scriptures themselves, the popish party gave them the name of apostolics. At length, Peter Waldo, or Valdo, a native of Lyon, eminent for his piety and learning, became a strenuous opposer of popery, and from him the reformed at that time received the appellation of Waldenses, or Waldois. Pope Alexander III, being informed by the Bishop of Lyon of these transactions, excommunicated Waldo and his adherents, and commanded the bishop to exterminate them, if possible, from the face of the earth. Hence began the papal persecutions against the Waldenses. The proceedings of Waldo and the Reformed occasioned the first rise of the Inquisitors, for Pope Innocent III authorized certain monks as Inquisitors to inquire for and deliver over the reformed to the secular power. The process was short, as an accusation was deemed adequate to guilt, and a candid trial was never granted to the accused. The Pope, finding that these cruel means had not the intended effect, sent several learned monks to preach among the Waldenses, and to endeavor to argue them out of their opinions. Among these monks was one Dominic who appeared extremely zealous in the cause of popery. This Dominic instituted an order, which, from him, was called the Order of Dominican Friars, and the members of this order have ever since been the principal inquisitors in the various inquisitions in the world. The power of the inquisitors was unlimited. They proceeded against whom they pleased, without any consideration of age, sex, or rank. Let the accusers be ever so infamous, the accusation was deemed valid, and even anonymous informations sent by letter were thought sufficient evidence. To be rich was a crime equal to heresy. Therefore, many who had money were accused of heresy, 
or of being favorers of heretics, that they might be obliged to pay for their opinions. The dearest friends or nearest kindred could not, without danger, serve any one who was imprisoned on account of religion. To convey to those who were confined a little straw, or give them a cup of water, was called favoring of the heretics, and they were prosecuted accordingly. No lawyer dared to plead for his own brother, and their malice even extended beyond the grave. Hence the bones of many were dug up and burnt as examples to the living. If a man on his deathbed was accused of being a follower of Waldo, his estates were confiscated, and the heir to them defrauded of his inheritance, and some were sent to the Holy Land, while the Dominicans took possession of their houses and properties, and, when the owners returned, would often pretend not to know them. These persecutions were continued for several centuries under different popes and other great dignitaries of the Catholic Church. End of chapter 4, part 1 This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780 780- Four five zero thirty seven thirty by fax at seven eight zero four six eight ten ninety six or by mail at forty seven ten dash thirty seven A Avenue, Edmonton. That's E D M O N T O N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A capital B, Canada, T six L three T five. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important. When he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.